so much for promising that where two or three are gathered, that you would be there too. So God, show us yourself today. God, let us put aside anything that would distract us from loving on you today, God. If there are chains in our lives, God, break those. And we just ask that you would have your way with us, God. We love you.
forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me I am who you say I am I am chosen, not forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me your kids. God, we thank you for being the perfect daddy. God, we thank you for loving us when we were unlovable. And God, we thank you for loving us unconditionally. God, we have worshiped you through song. In a few minutes, we're going to worship you through listening to your word and applying it. God, right now, we're going to worship you through giving our tithes and offerings. So God, I pray that you would take this and you would multiply it as only you can. God, let us give from cheerful hearts and let us thank you for your provision for us. Again, God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Charles. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Some famous quotes I want to give you. They're not famous, but I got them. President George W. Bush, you know this quote. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice. You shouldn't do that. You can't beat that quote. But here's one better than that one. Miss Alabama was asked... If you could live forever, would you and why? Her response in 1994 at the Miss USA contest. She said, I would not live forever because we should not live forever. Because if we were supposed to live forever, then we would live forever. But we cannot live forever, which is why I would not live forever. I would say she's in, wouldn't you? Without a doubt. Miss America, big time. Let me talk to you. Got a few more quotes. Here's another quote, part of my sermon. 
By the way, I'm starting a new sermon series today, a 10-sermon sermon series. Uh, people ask me sometimes, why do you do this with your legs? They cramp up. I'm better, but I'm just trying to look out. Lost my water. I need my water right there. So that's why. All right, C.S. Lewis said this. This is a pretty important quote. When it comes to the demonic realm, people fall into two categories. Either... They make everything about demons or there's nothing about demons. Take that first category. Maybe you're part of that first category where you're one of those believers who think there's a demon with everything. For example, uh, biscuits now at Biscuit there are 250 for a sausage biscuit. It's got to be the devil without a doubt doing that. Um, A traffic jam on Dixie Drive. Well, the devil's here. No doubt about it. The devil slowed up my traffic today. There was a time in my life where I got six tickets in one day. Glory to God. That's what I can say for that. Six. I mind telling you, six. It was so bad that my kids were just young. I think my oldest was six years old and Stephanie was probably four. I'm carrying Stephanie down Farmer Road. And he took my license from me. Can you believe that? And I got six tickets in one day. Uh, I'm walking home, and a lady stops the car, and she says, I usually don't pick up hitchhikers, but God told me you're a good man. I said, I am a good man, but I'm pretty dumb today, is what I told her. A lot of people would say, well, the devil did that. No, the devil didn't do that. My stupidity did that. A lot of times we want to blame the devil because we don't want to take responsibility. So there are some people that with everything there is, that's the devil. That's the devil. No, it's not. No, it's not. But then there are some people who they don't believe the devil is at all. There are some churches in America where they don't even believe in the demonic realm. So that's just two extremes. There's a balanced extreme. In the next 10 weeks, I'm preaching out of Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, and I'm going to be talking to you. And it finally says in verse 10, it says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. You know, the devil could care less whether you believe in him or not. He doesn't care. He's not after your recognition. He's after your destruction. I mean, he just wants to nail you. He doesn't care if you believe in him or not. It doesn't matter to him. He just totally wants to wipe you out. So if you don't believe in him, he don't care because he just wants to destroy you. Paul ends the book of Ephesians in chapter 6. And he says again, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. It then says in verse 13, therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and have done everything to stand. And then in the next verse, he says, stand. So here's what he's saying. When it comes to fighting, fighting the enemy, you are to simply stand in the strength of God. Stand. There are only two times in the epistles where, God's, where Paul says, get out of town, or where he says, flee. He says, when it comes to sexual temptation, do not stand there and try to fight that. Paul says, get out of town. I mean, flee. Get on the bus, Gus. Make a new plan, Stan. Drop off the the key, Lee, and I got to go get free. But Paul says, run. So when it comes to sexual immorality, temptation with sex, you're going to lose that. Run. The second thing he says run about, he says, when it comes to the love of money, Run. The only two places, he says, to flee. When I saw that and studied that this week, he tells us to run from sexual temptation. He tells us to run from the love of money. I call it this. When it comes to monies and honeys, run. (laughs) Just get out of town, right? Monies and honeys, get. Just that simple fact. So we come here in the word of God. I just got two points as I do this introduction this morning. It's real simple. 
why should we, according to verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power? Simply because of reason one, because of the enemy we face. 1 Peter 5, 8. This will be a key verse today. Peter says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. I remember growing up in the Independent Baptist Church. And it just sometimes the Independent Baptist just comes out in me when it comes to preaching. Them Independent Baptist preachers, they would do the inflection of their voice. And they have classes on this, I've told you. And when I, when I look at this verse, I want to read it Independent Baptist style. I don't know why, but I do. Yeah, be, be of sober spirit, yeah. Be on the alert for your adversary. Notice, it's your adversary, boy. It's not God's adversary. God doesn't have an adversary. Your adversary is out on the prowl and is out to devour you. He's a royal lion seeking, yeah, for someone to devour. Yeah, so I got to say. Wesleyan talk. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So Peter tells us to do two things when it comes to the enemy. Number one, be sober. And that means this, be in control of all, at all times, be, be in control of your emotions of all, at all times, and be disciplined. So, man, that's, that's, that's two big words. I've got to be in control, and I've got to be disciplined. Then, of course, he says, be on the alert. Uh, I had a neighbor when I lived in Denton. In fact, there's some family in this church this morning that's family to this guy. I'm not going to call you out, but you know who I'm talking about. My neighbor was Patrick, and Patrick was a great neighbor, but I would go see Patrick, and Patrick had a 17-foot python, and I mean, he was a bad boy. The, he named the python Baby, and I thought, what a name for a snake, Baby. And so I would go see Baby, and I mean, this snake was as long as from here to that wall, and when you would pick him up, if you've ever felt a bag of wet concrete, how hard it is with this whole snake when you picked him up. He was that hard. I mean, you just knew this thing could really kill you probably. And so Patrick says, Charles, do you want to see me feed baby? And I thought, I've got nothing else to do. Feed baby. So I'm sitting there. I'm not sitting. I'm standing there watching baby in his cage, and then Patrick brings out a rabbit, and he drops that rabbit in that cage, and I mean, here's the rabbit on this side, and here's baby on this side curled up, and I'm looking at that rabbit, and I'm not exaggerating, that rabbit's heart, I mean, you can see that rabbit's heart beating, and he knew, I can't run, I'm dead. He said, if you don't watch it, You'll miss it. It's that quick. And I mean, baby, put that tongue out. Put that tongue out. And by that time, boom. It was so quick. I'm not exaggerating. I couldn't even see him hit it. There. And he hit it, boom. And this thing I knew, you know, you know, you know, had him curled up. This is going to crush you out. And all you heard from that rabbit was, just like he's weeping. I mean, got hurt. And we just watched the big boa baby eat that rabbit. And then he said this. We can pick him up now. I said, we eat nothing. <laughs> he said, no, baby's full. He said, now, well, I wash your hands. You've got that rabbit smell on you. He'll think that's you and he'll attack you. I said, I didn't touch the rabbit, brother. I said, I'm fine. He said, I'm going to take baby out, put him on the floor, and let him go some places. And if you want to pick him up, you can. One day he did that I was with him, and he had just fertilized his yard, and the fertilizer burned baby's stomach. 
baby took off through the yard. I mean, crawling. He told me to go chase the snake. I went and chased the snake. I had to dive on baby to catch that snake. But that wasn't this day. So baby is on the concrete floor. He says, you want to hold him? I said, not really. I said, I'm finding baby where baby is right there. He says, pick him up. You ain't afraid, are you? So said, no. See, that's pride. That's a man, right? <laughs> I said, give me that snake. So I said, how much that snake weighs? He said, about 150 pounds. I said, well, that's a pretty good hefty weight snake there. So we picked it up, and I got baby on my shoulders. And I mean, I'm thinking, you're an idiot. You are an idiot, Mose. This snake at any moment, if he wanted to, could just wrap you up. What are you going to do? And I thought, oh. and I looked up, and I saw on top of the cage a bottle, a fifth of vodka. And I thought, is that liquor? He said, that's vodka. I said, why do you have vodka down here? He said, if baby ever attacks me, I'm going to pour it down baby's mouth. I said, forget pouring it down his mouth. Pour it down my mouth right now. <laughs> Good night. So he had, but I mean, when I picked that snake up, man, I was so alert, so in control, so disciplined, so everything. And what we forget sometimes as believers, and we do, we forget there's the enemy. And we live our lives virtually every day, and I guarantee, and I'm not getting on to you, but I guarantee you it never crosses our mind. There's the enemy. He's out to destroy me. Uh, the first step to defeat is underestimating the opponent that you have. Tell me what these three people have in common. David was a man after God's own heart. Samson was the strongest man in the Bible. Solomon was the wisest man in the Bible. What do those three men have in common? All three of them were deceived by the devil. In other words, we are no match for Satan. That's why we got to be strong in the Lord. Most believers are not disciplined when it comes to the word of God. And please hear me, and I mean this from my heart. I'm in no way trying to browbeat me or browbeat you. Here's my intention today. I'm trying to show you today and show myself today how important it is for us to know there's a war going on. Now, for us to know what's going on, here's what we got to know, y'all. We got to know this. We got to know this word. Now, I'm guessing, but I would say some of us have not opened the Bible up this whole week until we got right there. And it's, we got to know this. I mean, this is the most important thing that I have in my house. This is the most valuable thing. This is the most valuable stuff you have in your house. It's more valuable than your car, more valuable than your house, stocks and bonds. This is the eternal word of God. This word of God will last forever. Most believers are not disciplined when it comes to the word of God. In fact, most believers are really malnourished and dehydrated with the word of God. So we got to understand the word of God is critical to my life. The word says that this book is living and active. You read most books, but when you read this book, this book reads you. This book is alive. I know it's hard to believe, but one of the names of Jesus in Revelation, he's called Word of God. This book is alive. When you read it, it reads you, and it cuts asunder, and it knows what's going on in your life, and it can read me, and it can read you. We are born again by the Word of God, not of corruptible seed, but something that's incorruptible by God's power, and the Word of God is a seed that lives and abides forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God abides forever. The grass wither, 
the flower fades, but the word of God will, ne will never wither and it will never fade. It is light to those who find it and it is health to their whole body. It is sweeter than honey. It is purer than gold. It is sharper than any two-edged two two sword and the word will stand forever. And I'm just telling me and I'm telling you, we have got to value the word of God every day of our lives and you've got to know the word daily. There's an enemy out there. He doesn't care if you recognize him or not. His intention is to take you down. In fact, he would rather for you not to recognize him. In fact, he would rather for you not to even know he's around because then he knows, I got him. It's no big deal. Because when you're in war and you don't know there's a war, you're done. You're defeated. Uh, we have authority, though, in the name of Jesus. He said, Charles, man, I just don't have any passion for God. This is simple, man. Are you in the Word? Charles, I just haven't wept for souls in a long time. Are you in the Word? Charles, I don't know the last time I shared my faith. Are you in the Word? I don't have any joy. Are you in the Word? I mean, the whole thing goes to, are you in the word of God? So we have this authority, and the authority comes from the word of God. Now, the, uh, the authority really amazes me. You know, a policeman can go on Dixie Drive today, and all he has to do to stop traffic, this is shocking, all he has to do is just do this one thing. Out walks a policeman on Dixie Drive. And here comes a big tandem truck, and here comes a big rig, and all he has to do is this. And traffic stops. I don't know about you, but if I went on ditching drive and did this, boom, I'm dead. I'm just a wet spot. But he goes on ditching drive, a policeman does, does this. And if he wanted to, he could stop traffic from Dixie Drive in Asheboro all the way to Cider City, and all he has to do is this. That's it. That's what you call real big time authority. What I'm trying to show you and trying to tell you is this. You and I this morning, we have authority in the name of Jesus. The point is, some of us don't understand the authority that we have. In Genesis 1, here's what happened. God gave us the world. Did you hear me? Do not miss this. I hit this three weeks ago. God gave us the world. He went to Adam and he said, Adam, I'm giving you dominion, authority over the world. In Genesis 3, it's a train wreck. In Genesis 3, who shows up? Satan. And Satan shows up in Genesis 3. And the reason he went to Adam and Eve was because Satan wanted to rule the world. When Adam and Eve sinned, they gave dominion and authority of the world to the devil. I don't believe it. I'll prove it. In Luke 4, in Matthew 4, at the temptation of Jesus, the devil tells Jesus this. He says, Jesus, if you will bow down to me and worship me, I will give you the kingdoms of the world. They were given to the devil by Adam and Eve when they sinned in the garden. Three weeks ago, I showed you that when he went down to Hades on Saturday, he took the keys away from him and Jesus died on the cross. That's why he says in Matthew 28, you know what he says in Matthew 28? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me and I give this authority to you. I'm telling you this morning, child of God, today we have authority in the name of Jesus. We are more than conquerors. We are victors and we have authority and we can rule this world. World, but the reason that we see everything in chaos is probably because we don't know there's a war going on. Well, yeah. That brings me to point two. Point one is simple. Trust in God. But point two is do not trust in your own power. I have this book in my office. It's out of print. It's a, it was a book that my, one of my, my one of my professors in, in seminary, he went on a safari to Africa. Now, for the first time in my life this summer, I'm going out of the United States. 
I'm praying for myself a whole lot already. Uh, I'm going somewhere. I'm not sure, but I don't know. But I'm going somewhere. Well, where I really want to go, man, I really want to go to Africa. And I want to go on a safari. And the reason being, I just, I don't know what it is, but I love watching, you know what I love watching, Discovery Channel, and I love watching the National Geographic Channel, and man, I love watching them. Lions, they just amaze me, amaze me. Well, in this book that my professor wrote, he went on a safari, and the book title is called Rules of the Jungle, right? So they went on a three-week safari. The first day of, of their safari, they had to go to a class, and here's what the teacher said in that class in Africa. They went to Botswana, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. Here's what he said. If you do two things real good, this is what will happen. You will go home alive and you will have a great time. And he said, before we could go on the safari, we had to sign a waiver saying that if we were eaten by lions, that we did not hold you responsible. That would be quite a signature, wouldn't it? Without a doubt. Yeah, if I get killed, I'm not holding you responsible or my family's not. So they had to sign this waiver. If we, get, if we get eaten by lions, you're not responsible. And here's the two rules the, the teacher gave the people going on the safari. Rule number one, he said, is in the book, stay in control. Because we're going to be in a vehicle. And you got to understand that when we're in this vehicle, there will be a lion coming to us. And the line will be as close as from here to there. And it will be that close to you. So what you've got to do, number one, is stay in control. Number two, he said, is you've got to be alert. So you've got two rules. If you stay in control, if you be alert, you'll live these three weeks and you'll go home. That's the same thing Peter said in First Peter. Be a sober spirit. Be alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking to take you out. So, in the class that we had in this class, when lions see something, they see like a big object. And you would think that if you're in this truck, that they can see you in the truck. They cannot. What they see is the truck. So he said, now, if you stand up, if you stand up in the truck, bad move. And he said in the class, he said, there was one couple from Japan. The guy got out of the truck. He didn't get back in the truck. The line took him out. So he was not in control. So he said, you got to stay in the truck because when the lion looks at the truck, he just sees a big truck. But as soon as you stand up, if you get out of the truck, the lion sees you and is going after you to take you out. What I'm trying to tell you is this. What the lion wants to do, the lion wants to separate you from that truck. Or this way. Let me explain it this way. In Matthew 18, verse 19 through 20, Listen to this. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on the earth about anything that you may ask, it should be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Hmm. Here we go. What's your first name? Jordan. Jordan. Okay, let's just say this. Jordan and I this week go to Chick-fil-A, right? So Jordan and I are in Chick-fil-A, just me and Jordan. Now, scripturally, who else is in Chick-fil-A? Talk to me. Who? Jesus, right? Y'all say it, say it. Jesus. So where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. So Jordan and I are in Chick-fil-A, and scripturally, Jesus is in Chick-fil-A with us. 
if Jordan and I tonight went to WrestleMania in New Orleans, whoa, that's what I say. WrestleMania in New Orleans. 100,000 people. If Jordan and I are in WrestleMania in New Orleans, you know who else is there also? Jesus, right? So imagine where two or three are gathered in my name, who is there? Jesus, which means that right now, right now in this church, who's in this place? Jesus, because you just taste two or three. When we come together in Jesus' name for fellowship, when we come together in Jesus' name for prayer, we come in his name and he is with us. And so when the lion looks at that truck, he sees that big truck, but he doesn't see the people. Scripturally, scripturally, when Jordan and I are together in the name of Jesus, and when the devil looks at Jordan and I, he doesn't see me in Jordan. He sees who? Jesus. Jesus. And, G and, G and the devil knows this. I'm no match for Jesus. I'm not going to attack him by no means. Prove it, Mose. Do you sense any temptation this morning in your life? Right now, do you sense any temptation? Do you know why? Jesus. But when you walk out of this building in about 15 minutes, you're going to walk in the lions. Right? And you're going to feel temptation. But where two or three are together in my name, there Jesus is with us. Now what the devil wants to do is this. He wants to separate you from the body. So if he can separate you from the body, he has you. And here's what the guy said in the instructor. When a lion comes up on a pack of zebras, they're what, black and white, is that correct? Think about this, this is not hard. All he sees is black and white. He, the group's all together and all he sees is what? Black and white. But if one of those zebras become afraid, if they're not in control, if they're not alert, and if one of those zebras have themselves, now he doesn't see one big group of black and white. He sees one in the distance. Well, guess who he's going after? That one. Charles, I don't get it. I'm about to make it real clear. What the enemy is trying to do with us is this. The lion is looking for some animal that will get separated from the group to devour it. The Bible says in Isaiah that we all have gone astray. And so the devil wants to find someone in the body of Christ who is unteachable, who is full of pride, who thinks they know everything. And he wants to separate you from them. Does it happen? Oh. You came to church on Sunday morning, you had this attitude. Well, they didn't talk to me. Well, that person didn't speak to me. Were well, they offended me? Do you know what you do? You separate yourself from the body and you go in isolation. And when you get in isolation and you're by yourself and here's the whole body, but I'm mad at you and now I'm in isolation, man, I'm myself worn out. Amen? Amen? Yeah. We get worn out. And I don't know, but the best way I can describe this way is this. This morning, you are around a group of people who love you very much. Right? Can you say amen? amen. Okay. And Jesus is in the midst of us. Can we have amen? Amen. amen. And in the body this morning, in the body, there are needs in the body this morning. Don't you think so? Say amen. amen. But even though there are needs in the body this morning, Many parts of the body of Christ 
we walk out of here without that need being met. And do you know why? You said it. Pride. You separate yourself from the body. And so you have a need, but because of your pride, because of your pride, you do not say pray for me. And so all week, you don't get the H beat out of you. You get the Jesus beat out of you. And all week long, you go by yourself. And do you know what the devil does to you? Beat you down. He beat you down. He beat you down. Do you know why he beat you down? Because of your pride. You're so full of pride that you will not even let the body of Christ pray for you. That's how stuck up you are. That's how full of pride you are. Are you hurting? Yeah. Do you have problems? Yeah. Is Jesus in the midst of us? Yeah. Can he, can he help you? Yeah. Yeah. Will you let him? No. And you walk out the same way you walked in. Bored, frustrated, fearful, and defeated. And do you know why? Because he has separated me from the body. Yeah. Be sober. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is walking around looking for someone to go their own way so he can jump on them and devour them. And guess who let the devil do it? You did. Why? It's amazing. Because of pride. Okay. Are y'all with me? All right. Test time. Take a test. Pop quiz. All right. How many people this morning would say amen, and you would say, you know what, Charles? I need some encouragement. I need some help. I need some peace. I need some direction. I just need some help from God this morning. If that's you, say amen. amen. That's good. Now, for those that said amen, let's take it a step further. Say amen, and then raise your hand. That's real good. Hey, let's take it a step further, 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 further. <laughs> let's say amen. I'm thinking about start bleeding up here. <laughs> let's say amen. Raise your hand and stand up. Amen. 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 Raise your hand and stand up. 